Good morning, West USA, on this Halloween edition of our spooky Boo. Tuesday morning webinar. Uh, what do you guys? You guys got all your uh, costumes all planned out? Yep, I'm done. Uh, mine is. Uh, I'm gonna probably. Um, be dragged into HR when I show up uh, at our offices. <laughs> I, might be, I might be getting a little carried away, but we would like to uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Tuesday morning webinar where we're here each and every week to help you grow your business. All right, a little sneak peek at what we got coming up today. Uh, we got uh, Mick Bernard here from the Bookspan Baker team going to give us our mortgage a minute. Todd Bernard is going to give us a look at the numbers. going to give you a little three pack on things you should be asking top producers. We do so many events where we have uh, top producers to share their secrets and so forth. And there, there's several things that we should be paying close attention to. And then we got Marge Lindsay for a little mayhem this Ooh. morning. Ooh. Speaking of scary. I know. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, well, even scarier, don't do that with Bob. All right. Uh, to our questions, comments, uh, suggestions. If you need anything at all webinar related, feel free to email us at webinar at West USA. Dot com and we will get back to you as soon as possible. All right, I guess we're going to uh, start with Mick Bernard here. Um, so, uh, Mick, uh, what's going on in the market? Uh, the market's kind of trading a little bit sideways this way. Kind of, kind of another unique thing. We've actually jumbo rates and rates over four for loans over four fifty three are actually lower than conventional rates right now. So, uh, you know, buy 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 that luxury home. Now's the time, right? Get off that fence all and right, get her done. done. I'm all right. I'm out of here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Call up all your clients. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so other than that, they're kind of hanging in there, right? Talk to Brock O'Neill, see what he's got listed right there. Yeah, perfect. You know, I'm looking for a $3 million property right now. Twelve. Twelve. i I'm, I'm going to offer $250,000 on it, but I'm in the market. Oh, so you're the typical buyer in today's market. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's talk about something scary. It's actually not as scary as you think it is. And the fun little facts that we kind of put together uh, – Buying a home can be scary until you do know the facts. Um, a lot of people will say, hey, I need to have 20% down. Did you know that over about three quarters of the people that buy houses put less than 20% down? Uh, or you may have a client that says, hey, I don't have a good enough credit score. I need a 780. You know, the average credit score is 727 when somebody buys a house. Um, getting approved for mortgage is hard. Nope. Three quarters of all loan applications were approved last month. Uh, or, hey, I don't have enough equity, some people might be thinking. And, you know, now we're up to 96, about 96% 96 of all homeowners have positive equity in the United States that could sell their house, buy another house. Um, it makes me wonder how many people are just sitting there just have no idea. You know, they took the hit years ago, don't pay attention, and there's sitting on a gold mine. Sitting on, and not necessarily a gold mine, but sitting on an opportunity to go out and you know, and, and buy up, move up. Yeah. 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 I can tell you that once a month I have a conversation with a buyer that wants to get pre pre called to said, I'm not ready because I don't have my 20% down yet. Every month I have that conversation with somebody. And so there, there's just a lot of people out there that haven't been educated on how much easier it is these days to buy a house. I mean, it really is. If you have good credit scores, uh, we potentially can get you in with none of your own money. That's what I'm talking about. There's I mean, the racer, million dollar there's property, the tree. none of my money. Let's do it. I'll use Todd's money if we need any. <laughs> I'm just going to cap 350 on that. So, um, so there are, you know, there are limitations, but, but, but you, there are ways to get people into homes now. I mean, there just is, there's just so many programs, veterans with zero down, you know, they get an extra 1% for down payment assistance, or if they're going to, or if you have an FHA buyer, that's a you know, first responder. There's a lot of different things that we can, you can be marketing and we have flyers for all those. I mean, you know, VA first responders, teacher flyers. So if you're involved in a club, an organization, uh, you have a relative that is a firefighter you know, let's do some just get some cold brand of flyers together for you so you can go in and hand them out and make sure that everybody is educated on how easy it is to get into a property today all right and then more important well not more importantly i mean i, I think in addition to um this is just great great social media material right here and i know meg you and your team will uh willing to co-brand this with our agents and absolutely and great their too. brand on this thing and people can use this, this absolutely stuff i mean we assume that everybody knows that you know that you don't need 20 percent down but you're right people think that so we got to yeah. get the word out yeah absolutely get the word out let's uh let's get some people pre-called so we can uh get a good close out to this year all right, Mick, appreciate it as always. Yep. Thanks for uh, stopping by. All My right, pleasure. Moving right along to Todd Menard. Uh, let's take a look at the numbers. What do we got uh, cooking? What do we got going on? 
Hey, every, hello everybody. We're sitting at uh, 54 days closed on market, 2.78 months supply. So the last month when it was seven months supply, you can see that the numbers did correct. So it was an anomaly, which is kind of a good thing. 36.02 absorption rate, 527 is where we're at the average list price. 323 is the average sale price and 97.80. That's right on the number, right, Mike? Yeah. I mean, not even a plus or minus a tenth of a percent is perfect. Um, taking a look at active across the board, again, uh, grew just a little bit more, less than 1%, almost 1%, one-tenth of 1%, but 18,198 is where we're at inventory right now, up forty, uh, up 1.5%. We're sitting at pending at 4383. Closed units for the month, we're almost near the end of the month, so 5921, that's uh, down 6.5% in a comparison uh, from, uh, obviously, last year to this year. Uh, taking a look at new listings, we took under 2000, a little slowdown, 7.2% less than last week, 1959. And our days on market sitting at 156, almost 157 for the entire MLS. Uh, and as you can see, closed days on market, which is the more expeditious portion of the market, where 74, as you can see in the graphic right below, 74% actually are in that under five hundred thousand dollar market 74 percent of the inventory and they're averaging 75 days on market so the previous number right up there of days on market closed at 54 you know your note that that just tells you something if the average in that price range which is 75 percent of all of our sales is sitting there at about 54 uh, and the average is 75 then the properties that are ready and in the right location are selling quicker Taking a look at the spreadsheet across the board, uh, 19, as you can see, you can see the difference between the 1959 this week and the 2112 the week before. Um, multiplying that times 4.3, we're going to be lucky to be over 9,000, but we'll have to see by the end of the month. Uh, looking at active inventory, as we said, again, continuing to climb. So the green ticker's there. That's the second week in a row we've seen that green ticker. Uh, way over on the left-hand side, you'll see other tickers, and those happen to be uh, red, and that just means overall we're still not where we need to be. Uh, but the green ticker in the middle is telling you that you know week over week it, this is a good sign. At least it's trending upwards. Um, taking a look at pending across the board, averaging 43.83. Yes, the market is experiencing a little bit softer sales right now. Slide drives across. You'll see we're at 4,600 uh, average last month. The month before we were at 6,500. Now the difference between 65 and 46. Six months. That's normal. That, that's heading into the end of the summer market and the fact that uh, most agents don't really participate in the second home market. So, you know, there are much many, uh, there are fewer buyers, but there are many buyers still in the marketplace. So 4606 is where we ended last month, 4300. It looks like somewhere 4344 is where we're going to be throughout the uh, month of October, which basically shows that what you're feeling out there, there being potentially fewer buyers, that that's legit. Uh, but again, focus on second home buyers right at this particular moment and through the end of the year. So looking at the uh, closed data right now, 5960, uh, 5921, uh, which is where we are. We're at 6,300 last year, down just a little bit. Um, slide your eyes across again, 7,000 to 7,500. We were down you know, just a little bit, 6.5% uh, so last month. So if you're trending and you're watching the numbers, you're seeing in the middle the blue column, you're seeing six and a half is the year over year. And then you slide your eyes to the left and you see in the white column, six and a half percent is where we are right now. So we're consistent with what we experienced last month uh, as far as being less productive than we were uh, last year. So take a look at month supply, 2.78. As you can see, the 7.6 did correct. Uh, 2.7 right around there, just about 3%. That's exactly where we want to be, right in that sweet spot. 36.02 uh, is our absorption rate. Looking at the list prices, 527, sale prices, 323. Those are great. Those are consistent all the way through uh, the whole year. Those have been hovering right in those ranges. So, Mike, this is... This is, I think, a real important time again. I th I'm not sure if we talked about it last week or the week before. Just to talk about the myth that's out there in the industry that we're heading into a bubble. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the issue here is that, you know, again, any economic crisis could happen that could force us into some kind of other issue. But if we're just looking at housing, jobs, economic growth, uh, you know, we're looking at Arizona as it's versus the rest of the country. We're looking at population where we're going to have more population increases. And again, you're still seeing Mark Taylor properties and a lot of those large apartment complexes put up 
you know, apartment complexes, apartments, and you're probably saying, you know, why are they doing that? Well, it's because the market is expecting more people coming into Arizona than the residential housing market can handle. So as a result, they're, they're building more and more apartments to handle the growth. So uh, the other piece of that story is, again, if the, if the sale prices are not going up exorbitant, I'm talking about double digits, 10, 12, 18 percent, um, the likelihood of us going into an inflationary period is, is not it's probably not going to happen. And the reason also is if you notice the rates are, are not jumping to 7% or 7.5% to slow us down. You know, they are. You know, they're, they're going up to 5, 5.5, and, and then they're settling back down to 5. And we've been watching this trend all year. So these are two pieces of the puzzle that if you're talking to clients, that it's really it's really easy for them to understand. The prices aren't going up extraordinarily quickly, and the interest rates aren't going up to slow down the market. Those are the two things that would take place in the event that we were in some kind of a bubble. Uh, I will also say that was a recently a, a recap on the economic forecast, and, and we've been talking about this resetting of the economic uh, uh, um, you know, commodities, the price of cement, copper, everything along those lines, uh, which go into raising the prices. Same reason why a house that maybe was, you know, $26,000 in the 40s is now $300,000 today, you know, is, is yes, yeah, somewhat of inflation driven, but it's because of the the 30 year reset of the commodity market. And this is what happened. So it was supposed to happen in, in July uh, or September last year. It didn't, it was supposed to happen in July of this year. It was then scheduled for fourth quarter 19, mid 2020. Now I just heard that uh, national, all of the national uh, investment firms, the Smith Barneys, the everybody got together with NAR and the uh, results that came out of there was that Mike, now they're looking at approximately uh, 2023 uh, before any of those. So again, Good, clear sailing. Uh, none of the market is anticipating a crisis. Uh, of course, next year we are. You know, we do have this year an election year, so we'll see how that all that all that pans out. But that's pretty much where we're, what we're at right now. All the other numbers are right in line where they need to be. As I said last week, we're in one of the most stable markets right now that we've seen in a very long time. The only thing that could improve it would be inventory and more buyers. Yeah, it's interesting. And then, real quickly, on a more important note, uh, we did have somebody send us a text message. Um, I can't remember what you dressed up as last year for Halloween, but they said that was the best costume ever. So what did you remember? I honestly don't remember. I'll have to go back and look. <laughs> okay. It probably was nothing, which is why everybody was scared, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Anyways, uh, uh, appreciate it. All Thanks right. That. All right. So let's move right along to uh, the um, And As always, you can get a copy of these slides on the dashboard uh, later on this afternoon. Um, so we do a lot. You know, it's one of those things, Todd. If I, if I told you you could show up to an, a free event, and you're going to walk away with one to two really good ideas that top producers are using and you could implement into your business to help your business. What would be the what would be the challenge? Well, there? it would be a no brainer, you'd think. You think it would be a no brainer. Yeah. And so we do these events. We have these uh, last week we had Pro Secrets. We do these top producer panels. And when I take a look at I mean, we do a, we put on a lot of phenomenal events here at West USA. Totally. But when I take a look at these events. To me, these are the no-brainers because at any time that I can just hear from from top producers, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta show up, and, and it blows me away, and it amazes me that you know some agents just don't find the value in that, and oh, it, you know, I don't want to make the drive. Yeah, <laughs> okay, well. well, you know, then <laughs> you're from your now on the plane. But anyway, so when we get in those, when we do get in these events, when we do come across top producers in our offices. You know, I was thinking about what are some of the things that I think that we need to as agents be closely paying attention to um, so that you can just kind of just get rid of all the noise. And I was thinking, boy, if I was going to sit down with a group of, of top producers, what are some of the things that I'd want to know? And the first one would be is I want to know what their one thing is, is uh, OK, a top producer <laughs> has tried many things over the years and has tried many of the things that some of our agents are facing and considering right now. Uh, and they generally at some point settled on a primary source of business, a primary source of leads, a, a secret, like something that just that that makes their business model unique. And so they've already gone through the growing pains 
uh, even even on that one thing. Yeah. They've gone through the growing pains, what works, what hasn't worked, and and, and, and and so forth. So as a newer agent or an agent who is wanting to get to that level of being a top producer, I would, and these are the things, if you can go to these events and work out an event we're going to talk about in a few minutes coming up next week, uh, where you're going to hear from top producers. But I want to learn as many of the one things that are out there. You could have uh, you know 10 top producing agents up there on stage, and each one of them is going to have their own one thing. And, and I want to consider them. I want to look at them. I want to research each one. And, and now if I got a plate full of one things to choose from, then I figure out which one is going to make the most sense. Which one fits to my fits. personality? Yeah. You know, some people, their one thing is they can hammer down the door, knocking on doors, knocking on doors, knocking on doors. Um, and for some people, that not just so may much, not, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. they want to get out of their car. Yeah. No, it's so true. You know, Mike, we've talked about the secret sauce for a long time, uh, but we've talked about the fact that, you know, people go and they're always distracted by shiny objects, somebody that's doing well, and then they try to do that. And they find out that it's not right for them. But I think that's the benefit of going to these, you know, sure, there's some people out there that you may say, you know, I want to be successful, but I don't want to be successful that way. Or I don't want, I want to be successful, but I don't want to put that much energy or time or I, or I want to have more balanced life with my family, whatever that definition is. Eventually, if you go to enough of these, what you're going to find is these people that are on that panel, Mike, you, and you know this, you know, these are just normal people like you and I. I mean, these aren't like, you know, people that are the next Bill Gates. These are just people that have, have really just tried enough to find what works for them. And they're sharing that with you for free to save you from having to go through all those issues. All right, number two, I wanna know what their after the close process is like. Uh, all the money is left on the table oh at the close of escrow. The typical agent closes escrow, here's a $50, $100 Home Depot gift card, and now they're chasing the next lead. The yeah. gold mine totally is, is the person that you just closed on, whether it's a buy or sell. So one, I want to know what they do for closing gifts. Um, some top producers um, are customized the closing gift based on the relationship that they've been building th through, the through the escrow period. They might, they might gravitate to something that their buyers have said. Uh, and some just, you know, have something, you know, branded to them. They put some money into it. They put some thought into it. Uh, most top producers, uh, if not almost all of them, it's not just a just an afterthought. Oh man, I gotta go get my uh, fifty dollar Home Depot gift card and give them a card because because the closing gift is part of the after the close process is what's going to leave an impression on them. Uh, and how often then do they follow up with their clients? Uh, is it is it monthly? Is it what do they do in the first thirty days? What do they do in the first six months? What do they do in the first twelve months? Um, you know, what's the frequency in which they are they are touching their their clients, and and how are they touching their clients? Is it a rotation of emails, texts, of, of Popeyes, and or stopping by, or doing coffee, or whatever the case is? Uh, and what do they do? to remain top of mind. I like to call them Tom events, top of mind events. Do they do client appreciation parties? Do they do something for Christmas, handing out pies or and, and, and so forth? So top producers realize that the money is in the existing clients because the existing clients represent um, repeat business and also represent referrals. You know, how many times have you heard of uh, multi-level marketing companies or people that have, you know, gone into those? Some are highly successful and some fall flat on their face. They sell their mother, brother, cousin, sister, relative, and then they're done. But the successful ones le left clues along the way. And a lot of the 8 by 8 foundation programs and the 32 touch programs and the things like that were all created out of that industry, which really comes from they're taught don't go sell a product. They're taught, go create relationships yeah. and share what you do with other people and other people will come to you. You know, this is a great point, Mike. After the close, this is, you know, probably 80 something, 90. There, I don't know the statistic. I don't even know that there is one. But it's it, but we what we do know is that NAR says that, you know, 80 or 90 percent of the people say they'll use the realtor again and only 22 percent do. And it's because they don't follow up. Yeah, and, and it's not the consumer. And it's, and it's <laughs> right. And it's not. Yeah, exactly. And it's not even them doing business again. It's their sphere of influence. Yep. Yeah. And the third thing I want to know is how do they ask for referrals? Um, you know, that's funny. When we do our think tanks and our mastermind groups um, with our top producers, this is one of the questions that they do ask each other. Um, because there's different philosophies behind asking for referrals. But at some point, um, you have to have a strategy in which you are going to get <laughs> referrals from 
your sphere of influence and, and past and even present clients. Um, so you got to figure out what your philosophy is. Some um, have no hesitation whatsoever coming out and flat out and asking for referrals. Um, and it's part, and they're good at it. They feel confident enough in it. They, they feel very confident in the relationships that they've built. And some agents don't feel as confident with just coming out and asking for referrals. They may, you know, I put the word term passive aggressive is probably not the right term, but, but they like to kind of just, you know, kind of, you know, continue to really hone in on, on serving their clients and, and just, you know, reminding them that they're in the business. But whatever the case is, you have to figure out what your philosophy is. And you have to uh, figure out what, you know, what your style is. And that's what you want to hear. That's what you want to learn from top producers. Um, and what do they do? And then what do they do for the person that does refer yeah. business? Uh, you know, if you if you refer me as someone and and I help that person buy a nine hundred thousand dollar or three hundred thousand dollar house and I'm going to make a nine thousand dollar commission. I can tell you I'm not giving you a fifteen dollar uh, Starbucks gift card. Hey, thanks for the referral, pal. No, we're going to Ruth Chris. You know, we're going to I'm going to because you've proven to me that you're willing and able to send me business and help me make money. You know, and, and how you and what you do is so specifically different based on each person's behavioral assessment as well. I mean, we talk about that all the time. Every one of these, Mike, each of these three things really is honing in on you as, a, as the agent, as an individual, and what works for you. How, how, how comfortable are you asking for referrals? Are you bashful? You know, um, are you aggressive at it? You know, do you want to just post, and you tell us all the time, like stories about the people that you've helped, that all of a sudden when your friends and family come against someone who has those similar issues, they immediately think of you, whatever it might be. The point is, these are the most important three things that I've seen us talk about uh, in a while. These are great. All right. So with that being said, I know uh, we talked about, you know, we do these three events. We do have a, an event coming up um, that is near free. I mean, it's $10 to attend. And with the West USA discount, it's $5 to attend. And you are kind of a, as a follow up and a, and a segue into this. It's an opportunity for agents to come and hear from top producing agents as well as leading entrepreneurs, people that have been highly, highly successful in their unique industry. Because what I've learned is um, we're as agents, we're entrepreneurs. So um, if you're an entrepreneur at the top of your game in a different industry, it all it all transcends, it, you know, and, and I, there's so much to learn. So we do these we do this event, the Six Figure Mindshift Entrepreneur Summit each and, and every fall. And it's an opportunity just for our agents to hear from and not only just top producers at West USA, but top producers from other companies. Yeah. And they're so gracious to give up their time and share the stage. For those of you who are out on the East Valley, you're very, everybody out there is very, very familiar with it. Templeton Walker. Uh, I got lenders like buying tape, but they want to just come just to hear him, yeah. <laughs> him yeah. speak. Um, you know, West Side, we got our own Dan Fry. We got Todd Smith and then Doug Hopkins, a longtime uh, KTAR yeah. host. Yeah. And, and Doug is one of the original flipper real, you know, reality show Television, stars yeah. and, and TV and so forth. So um, I, I, we can't. And so what we wanted to do, we wanted to make this as inexpensive as possible. So we literally doubled what our sponsors have to pay to be here so that we can just subsidize this so that we can make this as inexpensive as possible. And can't go so to for, for five bucks. <laughs> Yes, but I, I know how to I know how to work my way around one of those menus as well, uh, and so I, I just in, in, encourage our agents. You know, this is a, a fantastic opportunity, and if you don't if you don't really see the value in coming to hear speakers like this um, and investing five dollars into your business, um, I don't really want to hear you cry twelve months from now when business is tough because these are people that are doing it and being successful. So we're going to send you out the link to six. Figure events, uh, so you can get registered uh, for that. Uh, that is a week from uh, Thursday. Uh, so crap, I got a little bit of work to do. <laughs> it's coming up quickly for that. All right, and so also many of us have gotten the free I Found Agent websites over the last couple of years. These are phenomenal websites. Oh We're sitting on a gold mine, but we don't know how to use them. It's like having that that uh, that Porsche. I remember when I was. 15 my friend goes let's take out my dad's porsche and so i got behind the wheel i took it out and it was a stick shift <laughs> okay i never got it out of first gear okay but so we, we so we got this port these this website it's like a port but we don't know how to use it so they are going to provide some new training um some new trainers coming in bring your laptop if you don't bring your laptop 
We're going to kick you in the you know where and send you home. Now, bring your laptop. And so we got two events, Thursday, November 1st, here in the morning at the Corporate Training Center, and then that afternoon at the Chandler office. So your chance to get additional training uh, on your iFound agent website. So go to the West USA calendar um, and uh, look up on Thursday, November 1st, and click on that, and you can register for that event. We also want to let you know we got our new uh, our new video out with it. This is this is a great one because we, we had Cager from Zillow come out, and it's fascinating content, things that we don't need, uh, things that we didn't know about Zillow, uh, kind of dispelling some of the myths and, and really just talking about Zillow. So I encourage you to go here, check out our newest, uh, and man, we just did. I just love to eat burgers, man. I don't know what you knew that about me. <laughs> All right. So anyways, Todd, appreciate it that. as like always. It. Um, and so hopefully we'll see everybody next Thursday and then November 1st for um, for the training. All right. We're going to bring on our very, very good friend, Marge Lindsay, uh, for a little mayhem with Marge. Uh, and so uh, we always like to bring her in whenever she has time because she's so busy, but we always love it when you have time for us, March. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. All right, so uh, what are you going to be for Halloween? On a plane. You're going to be on a plane. <laughs> oh, are you going to NAR? Yeah. Yeah, we have the... Are you flying Southwest? No, I'm Because flying... I think if you dress up on Southwest, don't you get free cocktails? I don't know. I'm not on Southwest either. I picked it wrong. <laughs> I got to tell you a story about a Southwest flight on, on Halloween one time, but that's uh -oh. a, that's for uh -oh. after the show. You okay. and I, I'll, I'll share that. All right. Okay. Anyway, so let's just jump right into it because we got four phenomenal uh, scenarios here, and uh, this one is like a book. So I want to try to get through it as as soon as or as quickly as possible. <laughs> All right. A residential agent listed a property in a historic district in North Central Phoenix. He had difficulty in determining the market value because not much had sold, and this property had commercial buildings on one side of it. He finally listed it for 350k. A buyer contacted him wanting to purchase the property and he said that they would rezone for commercial use. He wrote the contract as a limited representative, dual agent, that's what the agent did. While in escrow, the appraisal came back for 350k. The lender wanted a second appraisal and the second appraisal also came in at $350,000. While in escrow, a realtor neighbor, oh god, don't oh, you that love them? Never, it, that never turns out right. <laughs> well, a while in escrow, a realtor neighbor, and don't be that realtor neighbor, folks. Okay. Uh, showed the seller <laughs> properties and told the seller he had sold his home way too low. He insisted the seller could have gotten at least four hundred eighty to five hundred thousand dollars and showed some comps he had to support his statements. After the close of escrow, the seller filed an ethics complaint signing, citing Article 11, which says the services which realtors provide to their clients and customers shall conform to the standards of practice and competence. I should have probably read this a long time ago, uh, which are reasonably <laughs> expected in the specific real estate disciplines in which they engage, specifically residential real estate brokerage, real, real property management, commercial and industrial real estate brokerage, land brokerage, real estate appraisal, real estate counseling, syndication, real estate auction, yada, yada, yada. The seller believed and charged that his agent was acting outside of his area of expertise. This is a tough one because I don't know what the realtor's experience was. I don't know whether it was outside of his expertise. Does he have, did, does he have past experience in commercial? Now, if I'm going to assume that this was probably the first time that this listing agent came across a scenario in a historic area with commercial buildings. And, and if that was the case, then I would say that he was acting outside of his area of expertise. Wrong. No. <laughs> the decision in this particular case was that the agent wasn't operating outside their area of expertise. The fact That's what I meant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want a cheeseburger, too, so what can I tell you? But uh, they said, no. I mean, here we do have a residential property. It was currently zoned as residential property. The appraisal came in at 350000 okay. The lender did have some concerns and said, let's go ahead and get a second appraisal and did. And with that second appraisal, it also came in at the 350. And that's basically what the weight was placed on when the panel was trying to make a decision. You know, what could happen down the road is 
unknown at this point in time. But, you know, the reason that I really liked this one, Mike, and wanted to go through it, you start asking yourself the question, and my understanding is that the agent was a residential agent, didn't know commercial properties and so forth. When I asked some follow-up questions, you know, where were those appraisals, or I mean those comps, that the other realtor came up with, I don't know that. I wasn't a party to that hearing, and I don't know that when they insisted 480 to 500,000. But there were so many different uh, things that I think we can learn from this one. You know, when we talk about not operating outside one's area of expertise, it's not just residential versus commercial or residential versus property management or some of those things. You know, we it's have also a, areas. It's like, exactly. it's, like, it's like, you know, I would never. If I had someone who wanted to, to buy something up in the White Mountains, it's a whole different animal. And Absolutely. I'd be referring them to the Olivas because, or the Olivas team, because that's out of my area. There are things up there that I've never heard of. Right. You know, and I would do nothing but get my client into trouble. Well, and or get you in trouble for letting your client <laughs> walk into okay, that. True. But yeah, there are so many, many things. I mean, and it's. You know, I just wanted to stress the fact that there are so many other things that are involved and those referrals from out of areas and, you know, some of the uh, specific things that are happening in those areas. You know, one of the things we talk about in Tucson, there are th safeguards and protections for the pygmy owl, which has been dubbed as an endangered species. So if I Ooh. have... Pygmy owls. You didn't get the joke. Who? Oh, gosh. Get <laughs> Come it. on. You're right. That's funny. That's funny. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, so if I have a specific, that really was good. <laughs> if I have a specific type of cactus on my property, I can't remove it, even though it's on my property, mm -hmm. because that's where the pygmy owl you know, lives. And so, I mean, there are just so many things. So yeah, pricing certainly could be one thing. Geographic areas clearly can be another. Well, and I'll just do a quick plug for uh, ProStart because there are many agents who have not attended ProStart and they're residential agents and they're looking at doing their first deal. And I could tell you it's out of your area of expertise. <laughs> you got to get pro. You got to get, you got to learn from Marge on how to get yeah. it done. All right. Number two, a realtor was invited to be a participant in a closed forum on the internet. This wasn't exclusively for realtors. Several people were invited to participate, but they had to be invited to join. Another form had a similar makeup of invited members as part of their exclusive and closed group. Well, we're gonna. This is we're gonna see more and more of this. Uh -huh. One individual in the second group was also part of the first group. He was not a realtor, but did see a posting where someone had mentioned a realtor. The message said, "Joseph is a bad realtor, and people should not use him for their real estate needs." When he read the posting, this participant forwarded the posting to a friend of his in the other form. His reasoning was that he wanted friends and participants to know that they were that there was someone out there that others said were bad and should not be used. Not everyone in both forums could read the comments. The broker for the broker for one of the realtors men, mentioned was contacted and asked to take the posting down. Uh, the broker refused, saying he didn't post it, and the person who did it isn't a realtor, so they had no obligation to take the posting down either. The realtor who was said to be the bad said to be bad filed an ethics complaint against the broker and his agent. Is this a possible ethics violation? Why or why not? If yes, which article would apply? First of all, the very last question, I don't know what article would apply. I haven't read those in a long time. Uh, so... Um, um, so the question is, does the broker in question control and is a administrator of the closed Facebook page? I'm assuming it's a Facebook page. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. So then he, if so, so he would be considered an administrator and a moderator. So he, he has the ability uh, to take it down. And I would say, okay, this is a tough one. I don't know the right answer, but I know what is right to do and i think that broker has the obligation to to take it down okay. because it's disparaging an, another licensed real estate agent and we all know consumers you know there's always two sides of the story maybe sure. that agent isn't bad and now we're in a situation that a broker is refusing to take action that could be costing that other agent uh, the ability to earn income. Okay. And the reason I picked this one, when you said we're going to see more and more of this, we are. 
right now at the National Association of Realtors level, they are very concerned about social media and the implications. I know one of the things that the Professional Standards Committee at NAR was asked to do was write another article giving us then 18 articles in the Code of Ethics to address specifically social media. They have declined saying, no, we don't need to do that. To give you the answer, it's Article who's, 15, who's the National Association of Realtors. Oh, they said, we're not, well, no, I'll t you won't when I tell you why. <laughs> but they said, the reason we're not going to, Article 15 does address it. Instead, what they're looking at is adding additional standards of practice, which mean interpretations and more clearly define what you can do, should do, shouldn't do, and so forth. But the reason I brought this up is because not only is this happening, but we have, we, AAR even, have major concerns about what's being said and what's being done, especially in these forums. Many of us feel, hey, you know, it's in a closed forum. We can say and do what we want. And in fact, you can't. And you shouldn't be able to. Oh, gosh, no. And chan or channel, <laughs> Article 15 just says, Realtors shall not knowingly or recklessly make false or misleading statements about other real estate professionals, their businesses, or their business practice. But Standard of Practice 15.2 says, the obligation to refrain from making false or misleading statements about other real estate professionals, their businesses, and their business practices include the duty to not knowingly or recklessly publish, repeat, restate, retransmit, or republish false or misleading statements made by others. This duty applies whether false or misleading statements are repeated in person, in writing, by technological means, meaning the internet or by any other means. So in other words, just transmitting that to somebody else is the same as me saying right. or doing something. So, so uh, you know, the other thing, I mean, and I know there's there's some big real estate forms here. There's there's one that's here in the valley here that I know, you know, we got over 10,000 agents on it. And it's, in my opinion, it's a train wreck. And I always, I'm, I'm always, I'm always thinking because I feel like, um, well, the people who are responding to them are not the adults in the room. I feel like I'm the adult in the room, and I never feel like an adult in the room uh, because I'm asking, I'm always going, saying to myself, there's always two sides of the story. So these agents, first of all, they they rail on their clients, okay, and and everybody goes, oh man, your client's bad, da 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 da, because we're taking that agent at face value, believing that that agent is absolutely perfect, and God forbid would never do anything wrong. So I always want to know both sides of the story. Uh, I was there was one the other day. Um, and I can't tell you, Marge, how many times I just delete before I hit return. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it, it, so there was an agent on there, this whole deal on can't other agents be more respectful to other agents? Why do we have to put uh, lock boxes on the side of the house on water spigots and gas lines and, and so forth? Um, because I've got to walk around and, and it's not fair that I have to go look at it. And basically, and everybody's jumping on. Yeah, the agents are jerks for, for doing that, you know, and agents should be more respectful for other agents. You know, I kept thinking the whole time. It's not about you. That's... It's about the damn client. Yeah. Okay. What if the client's living in the house and doesn't want a, a lockbox on their front door? Don't want a lockbox scratching the front door. But the, the, the it, it, it's they get so consumed. It's a it's a cesspool of narcissism. <laughs> you, you know, Bob. Bob. You know, and it's yeah. not about you. And and don't rail on other agents because you know what we were all there one day. You know what we all did our first contract. Oh gosh, yes. And we all, and then they, the other thing, they rail on the new agents. Oh, we got all these new agents. I don't know what they're doing. First of all, you were a new agent. One, two. If it bothers you that bad, take a new agent underneath your wing and coach and mentor them. Well, you know this one brings I'm like, up. This gets so, me hot and bothered. Oh now. yeah. Well, and it brings up so many other, you know, issues. And you know, when you mentioned the new agent, that was an area that I hadn't even thought about mentioning. However, I'm going to. If you ask Judy Lowe and or her prior commissioners. You know, we always say, well, that's because it's a brand new agent, brand new agents. The brand new agents are not the ones who create the problems. The, uh, the issues and the problems come up when the agents are three to maybe five years in the business because now they think they're smart enough to circumvent the system and get around it and not get caught with the things they're doing. So the, the newbies, if so to speak, are not the issues. But the, the biggest thing when we're talking about 
you know, this and, and watching what you say in these forums, many of the best real estate attorneys here in Arizona have said, this is a major lawsuit waiting to happen yep. because they are in many cases making comments that could be antitrust and or boycotts and or this sort of thing. And there are some, and, and I'm, I did tell her, I was going to use her name. Jesse Walnick is one attorney who says, I personally just dropped out of these. I don't even want to be no. a part of it. And the reason I don't, if and when that lawsuit is filed, can I be found guilty just because I'm a part of it, even if I've not contributed? You're, and you're part of it and you're not trying to rectify the problem. Is there liability? That's a great question. Well, and, and we don't know. But... No. And, and when I talk with somebody like Scott Drucker, he, he said, I respect Jesse's opinion entirely because, you know, that's taking it with a complete black and white issue. But the other part of it is he doesn't think that it's automatically guilt by association. But the bottom line here and the, the message I like to see us go away from, quit asking your peers who may or may not be yeah. giving you the right answers. Go to your brokers yeah. to get those answers. Yeah, and somebody did uh, text in, what if it's a true statement? In my opinion, it, it, it doesn't really matter. If, if you want to post and ask a question and say, hey, came across this situation, you know, that's one thing. But when you go, I don't care if it's true or, or not true. When you go on the offense and you attack somebody, uh, you know, you you might be liable, you yeah. know, and, and I think we are. I mean, I think, we're, uh, you know, there's a, there's a way to do it and a way to handle it. And everybody knows, you know, everybody who's listening to this knows exactly what I'm talking about because we're all on the same forums. Yeah, and... one of the things that I often, you know, when you say, well, what if it is true? Okay, how many wrongs does it take to make a right? Yeah, and you yeah. know how many things I've done? That would be classified as true statements. <laughs> okay, yeah. I don't want to be. If you've got a problem with me, then your broker can contact my broker, and let's. That's that's how we used to do it in the old days. Let the let the brokers go out in the back alley with their little six shooters yeah. and work it out, right, Bob? <laughs> well, I'll get rid of an agent maybe there too. <laughs> All right, unfortunately, Marge, we got time for one more. All right, um, because that one that was a good one. We we just I could spend all day talking about that stuff. But anyways, uh, number you want to do number three, or number four. What's your favorite one? Take your pick. All right, the seller agreed to. Oh, that's a cure notice. I love these. A seller agreed to sign a cure notice when she dated May thirty first. However. She then directed the listing agent to hold off a few days to see if the buyer could perform. A few days later, the buyer still hadn't performed, so the seller then directed the listing agent to deliver the cure notice to the buyer on June 4th. Three days passed, and the buyer still did not perform. The seller submitted a cancellation and a request for the earnest money. The cancellation request was sent to both the title company and the buyer's broker. The buyer's agent and broker stated that the cure notice was invalid because the seller signed it on May 31st but didn't deliver it. Must a cure notice be delivered the same day it is dated? Was this now invalid? I would say 100% absolutely no. The only thing that matters is the date of delivery. You got it. God. Wow. Okay. We got time for this one then. All right. All right. <laughs> we don't need to discuss that one. That All was, right. Come on. That was easy. The buyer signed a contract with the seller to purchase the home for 200 k with $5,000 earnest money. The buyer refused to close the transaction. The seller issued a three-day cure notice. And when the buyer still refused to close, the seller canceled the contract. The seller then immediately signed a contract with buyer number two to sell the home for $220,000. This transaction with buyer number two has now closed. Buyer one contends that the seller suffered no actual damage. Oh, this is a good one. Mm -hmm. Suffered no actual damages due to the buyer's number one's breach, and therefore the buyer is entitled to the return of the $5,000 earnest money. Is buyer one entitled to return of the $5,000 earnest money? I would say no way, Jose. That's my answer. And you're right. Yeah, there's nothing matter about You're damages right. or no damages. I mean, it's a just, matter of not not performing. Yeah, one has nothing to do with the other. That's absolutely correct. And the fact That's that he was able one. to yeah, you did good too. No, but I like oh, this one. Wait. Yeah, but but there are some who've argued. Well, wait a minute. That's unjust enrichment. No, they don't know how to apply. You know this unjust enrichment situation. But no, that's absolutely correct. The second contract had nothing to do with the first. They were the ones who were in breach. They didn't perform. They didn't cure when they could have cured. And uh, so, no, they're not entitled to the 5000 
And there's other things that we don't know about. We don't know about whether, you know, what happened with the house that they were moving into. We don't know about the delay in moving. I mean, there's so many factors. Not a matter of that they were able to sell the house again. I mean, there's other factors. There's, there definitely could have been losses and damages incurred by a seller who's now got to wait another 30 to 45 days for a second buyer to close. But, you know, I, I don't even think if that was the case, it would be a consideration. Because still, what happens after the fact, you know, and beyond this, has nothing to do with this particular transaction and the forfeiture of the five thousand for non-performance. So All right, so you well, did good. I did good. All right, so I blew it on the first one. <laughs> so seventy-five percent. All right, Marge. Um, okay, let's, before you leave today, get with Sarah. Let's get you on again. So let's get a schedule. So right. uh, I love these. This is Sarah was telling me earlier. This is her favorite, a reoccurring segment that oh. we do. Uh, because she likes to see me look stupid. But not today. Way, by the way, if I, if I may, ah, ah, ah. it's something that just came up that you don't even know about yet, so I'm going to tell you, and that is we, again, have scheduled one more GRI class on December 11th. It's Market Essentials, and several of our agents said, hey, I need that in order to get my GRI. I need that to finish up. Can sure. we do it this year? So we have just booked it. We'll getting some promotional materials to you later. But, I mean, it literally was finished just before I came over here to talk All right, to you. Well, fantastic. Morning. Then mark, mark your calendar. That's December great. 11th is going to be up here at the corporate office. Yes. All right, perfect. March, uh, always appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And happy Halloween and have a safe safe travels to NAR. All right. And enjoy yourself. Okay, Oops. thanks. All right. <laughs> Bob, what are, you, what are your thoughts on these uh, Facebook forums? Facebook forums, These closed groups where agents are bickering about uh, each other. They 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 got to live by the laws, uh, the the rules, everything that the commissioner sets up. Uh, they don't get to go outside of anything, and I won't let them, as far as I'm concerned. So there. I have. All right, Bob, help us stay out of trouble. What are you dressing up for for Halloween? Well, I started today. I'm the only one with orange in here. <laughs> oh, you'll be surprised. Matter of fact, I may stop by tomorrow. I've got a another one to do at Awatuki. i got to stop by there and do something, but I may be by here tomorrow. Don't, anyway. bring, don't bring your wife because what I'm going to wear is not for the faint of heart. I just have to tell you. <laughs> now I'm curious as heck. Well, I'll tell you, I've got, um, as a matter of fact, it, it came in earlier here about, uh, oh yeah, I just wrote it down here. Here it is, uh, $10,000 short appraisal. And a uh, guy said, called me yesterday, he said, what do I do now? I said, get a reconsideration. Can you prove that they're wrong, that the appraiser's wrong? He says, yeah, I can prove it. Good. Reconsideration. But wait a minute. You got five days to get this all done. Can you do it in that time? Well, I think so. Well, you don't know what other people are going to do, and how is the appraiser going to act, and are they going to come forth with it? Uh, are they going to get the work done? You don't know. And, you know, I understand that, and I've written something for you guys, and nobody has ever used it that I know of. Maybe I just don't know. But I, I, I thought about this a lot, the appraisal. I would write it into the original contract. Reconsideration of appraisal. And I say right here in Bob's clauses, this is recommended to be in the original contract. Under appraisal contingency on line 107, if either party to this contract contests the appraisal, either party, and request a reconsideration by the appraisal company, the five-day notice to cancel, per line 109, time period shall begin on the next day of receiving the results of the reconsideration. So that would give you a little more time. Uh, sometimes they get all cranked up on these things and they go past that date and then they don't know what to do. But if this were in the contract, the original one, and some may like that and some may not, I don't know. But that's where I would write that to make sure that I'm going to get it. Um, 
a lady called me this morning. She says, I'm writing a backup on a contract. What are the words we're going to use on that backup, Bob? Well, I'm driving the car and I'm not exactly reading paperwork or anything. <laughs> so I told her, well, it, this is easy. I do have clauses for backups, but then AAR went to work and created a backup situation for you, and it's called the Additional Clause Addendum. If you go there on zip forms, you can get it out. It states everything you need to know. It's perfect for stuff like this, and I don't have to uh, um, try to quote it to you. Just go to zip forms and get it. It's an awful lot of good stuff in zip forms. Oh, here's one other guy called me this morning. I haven't called him back yet. He says, well, your agent said he would pay half of a home inspection. He hasn't done so so far. So I'll have to investigate that as soon as I get out of here and see what that is all about. And maybe the deal didn't even close. So if you're going to say, I'll pay half of the home inspection, you need to add something else to it. If it closes... Because if it doesn't close, you don't have any money to pay that unless you go to your bank account. But I would want to take the money out of the proceeds of my commission that comes in on that one. Something to think about when you promise somebody you're going to pay them. you, you got to be right up there with the money. What do I got here? Oh, a, a dirty rental. I get that a lot. People... Move into rentals and they're dirty. I, I, I don't understand why they move into these places if they're dirty. Why, why did you rent it if it's dirty? I don't quite get that, but there's an awful lot of them. At least they consider them dirty, but then they won't put it in writing what's dirty. So they need to put it in writing and get it over to them. Because I called the property manager and she said, well, I paid $500 to get that place cleaned up. She says, and if it's still dirty... Tell me what it is, and I'll send my cleaning people back out there. They need to do a better job. I'll see that it's clean for your folks. Oh, very simple, easy to take care of. But I spent, I spent some time on it trying to find her because it took me uh, a few calls to get to that point. Uh, uh, oh, here's, here's a fellow that showed her a listing. And after he showed the listing, or the listing expired. So he says, what do I do now? Well, this, <laughs> this is pretty easy, isn't it? Go take a listing. <laughs> it's expired, so go list it. Oh, I can do that? Yes, you may. It's not listed by anyone. Go list it and sell the house. I said, you could... Uh, Make out pretty well on there. And, and then uh, uh, some of these folks uh, give me a call, and they've been in the business a long time, but here's a guy that has, uh, he actually owns his, his own home. He's selling it. So he wants to know what kind of an agency disclosure form he's going to use here. Uh, I'll be a dual agent, he says, because I found a buyer. Well, no, N-O-O-P, nope, you're not going to be a dual agent here. This is your home, and you cannot dualify. Oh, is that what you call it, Marge? Well, that's a new word. <laughs> dualify, something like that. And uh, he said, well, who's going to represent this other fellow? The buyer. I, Nobody. Nobody. You don't have to have any representation there. Just uh, fill out the proper disclose, forms. Disclose. And disclose everything, and he should be okay. I uh, sold three of them myself last uh, year, and I didn't represent the buyers. There were tenants that were in there, and I sold it to them. And I represented myself on those things, so it's okay. And then uh, uh, another fellow called me with that same question. And we went back and forth, and he didn't feel real comfortable. He's got the buyer there. He says, I think I'll be a... Dual agent, I said, you don't have to. Uh, he did not own the home, but you don't have to be a dual agent. Just let him know wh who you're representing here. Write it up. Get it done. He says he wants to do it right away. I said, well, then get off the phone here and go do it. That's an easy one. 
Um, <laughs> I, I love some of these. Um, let's see where the, I, ha I had another one here. Somebody called me up and says, I'm a, a lawyer for your agent, and I understand you've got a bunch of emails uh, that you guys went back and forth with, and so I'd like to take a look at those emails. Well, I don't know who's on the phone. I said, I'll tell you what, I don't recall if I got a bunch of emails or not, but why don't you make a call to the designated broker? And, of course, when a designated broker gets something like that, then they start thinking, you know, insurance or something, and uh, it's a different story when it goes there. It has to be investigated before we say that we're going to do anything. So we got to know what these things are. Uh, I, I knew what he was talking about, all right, but I'm not going to uh, wake up and give it to him. Um Here's a guy that came back to work for us. He's been gone for a while, and he always used to have a lot of fun in sales meetings. He'd get in the back of the room, and he'd start talking like Clay Fouts, and nobody knew who he was. And he'd stand up and start looking for Clay. Clay wasn't there. This guy is so good at imitating Clay Fouts, you wouldn't believe it. And, of course, Clay has got a very deep voice and a distinct voice. So uh, this guy's back with us. I'm, he called me the other day. I was glad to hear from him because he's always been a good old boy. I've enjoyed having around. Okay, now, and preparing the home appraisal, the home book, preparing the appraisal home book. I have something that will tell you how to work this out and get uh, ready for an appraisal. Uh, it was sent to me by Paul Moore, and a lot of you have asked for it in the past. And I've got quite a bit of information here that will help you. Some of it from NAR, actually. And also preparing the appraisal home book from uh, Paul Moore. He says he's only had one ever that didn't appraise after he did this work with this. And you do it exactly as he says, and you'll get your appraisals in. It's, it's all in preparation starting from when you take the listing. That's where it comes in at, and you uh, find out what the extras are and what people paid for it, and you document all of this stuff in this appraisal home book. Give me a call or uh, email me, brokerbobcox.net. I'll send this to you, not a problem. I'd like for you to have it so that you work your appraisals like that. Another thing came up. Somebody sent this in the mail to me. No, it wasn't a bomb or anything. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> she said, Dear Bob, I will always remember the time when I got a complaint from a homeowner over my door hanging. She was hanging stuff on doors. And how you protected me and had my back. Thank you for always helping me. I'm very lucky to have you as my broker. By the way, I have a hilarious but true story for your don't do that. And so I sent her an email this morning and said, please send that to me and we'll use it here. I hope it is hilarious and true. So that'll be fun. Uh, that's what we call a tease. Yeah. So come back next week. Join us next week and Bob will have a hilarious don't do that. Looking forward to it. Bob, appreciate it as always. Um, and Marge, thank you again and have a... Uh, Appreciate you. Stop by. Have safe travels again to NAR. We leave you with the quote of the day from the dragon, Bruce Lee. The successful warrior is the average person with laser-like focus. Appreciate everyone joining true. us today. And go out and sell a home.